Marcus Witcher, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, it's great to have you on Reaganism. Uh, for those who don't know, you're an assistant professor of history at Huntingdon College in Montgomery, Alabama, and the author of Getting Right with Reagan, which I'll display here, uh, Kansas uh, University Press, book that came out in 2019 or so. And this is where you explore the struggle for true conservatism from 1980 to 2016. Uh, when you started on this project, Marcus, did you know that the struggle for true conservatism would be something that everybody would be talking about roughly in 2016 and I don't think has ceased since then? You know, I didn't anticipate uh, Donald Trump, uh, if that's what you're referring to. I did not anticipate the election of President Trump. Um, and so I didn't know whether or not the, the book would be sort of a hot topic, right, um, when it would ultimately be published. Um, I obviously began writing the book, um, began researching for the book while in graduate school, so probably around 2013, 2014. And so really didn't have any idea, right, uh, that when the book was published in 2019, it would be in the midst of what some have defined as a civil war for the heart and soul of not only the Republican Party, but also the conservative movement. We'll, we'll get to some of that, but take us back to 2013, your interest in understanding how movement conservatives, conservatives at large, viewed President Reagan during his presidency, and then all how they viewed President Reagan once he left office. Um, what what kind of got you into that that lane? Yeah, to be honest with you, it was um, a graduate seminar class. So it's a class where you come in and um, you're supposed to pick a research topic and then go and do, you know, primary research, etc. I had gone out to the Reagan Library um, and done some research over the course of winter break. Uh, I was a bit of an overachiever. So I was like, I'm going to go get my primary sources before um, I write uh, the article for my seminar class. And it actually, the impetus or the sort of the motivation for the topic came from reading Stephen Hayward's book, um, The Age of Reagan. And he just- It's he a two volume edition, right? This, this is the, I think, uh, critical biography. Uh, I think everybody recognizes it, uh, kind of a seminal work, right? Yeah, absolutely. Stephen, Steve's work is absolutely wonderful. I recommend it to everybody. Um, but I was reading that, and he mentions pretty early on, I think the second volume, that there were these conservatives who were really critical of Reagan. Um, and he has some good quotes in there. And so I took that to my graduate school advisor, Dr. David Beto at the University of Alabama, and he and I spoke about it, and he was like, I've never heard a whole lot about this. I definitely haven't heard anything about this uh, in sort of the scholarship. Maybe you should focus in and see if you can't come up with, dig a little bit and see if you can't come up with if there's something really there, is there something going on? And so that was the beginning of the project um, and I think the spring of 2013. Um, and then I just built off of that all the way up until I defended my dissertation in the, in the spring of 2017, so. So when you went out to the Reagan Library, you're at the archives, you're, as you said, overachieving, looking to see the conservative critique of President Reagan while in office. Was there a particular document, something maybe you saw in Hayward's book that you drilled down on, you're like, wow, there's there's a story to be told here. I'm, you got a bunch of them in the book here, but which one kind of captured your imagination? And when you got it, you knew you were going back to the seminar and you kind of figured this is the thing I'm going to do. Yeah, so there is a newspaper clipping um, that was put that was published by Howard Phillips, who was a what you might call him a new right activist, um, sort of on the sort of far right, if you will, of, of sort of the conservative movement, who was very, very, very irritated and frustrated with Reagan throughout his presidency. Um, most conservatives even considered him to be somewhat of a, a sort of a, a, a flamethrower, if you will, right? A bomb thrower. Um, and he published in, um, I think, something around 100 conservative new newspapers across the country, an image. Um, he took out an ad, a full page ad, and he had um, the headline was um, Appeasements as Bad in 1988 as It Was in 1938 Opposed the Reagan Gorbachev INF Treaty. Um, and when I saw the image of sort of Ronald Reagan next to Neville Chamberlain and the image of <laughs> Uh, you know, Gorbachev next to Hitler. I was like, wow, uh, so there's got to be something here, right? 
Uh, there's got to be something here because you can't you can't insult someone much more from a conservative perspective than compare them to Neville Chamberlain. To Neville Chamberlain, yeah, um, that, that's that's a good one. Maybe we can link to it in our in our notes here. Um, Howard Phillips, you you just referenced the new right. What you found in that document you just shared was, of course, the end of the Reagan administration. Of course, the new right and Howard Phillips was active prior to and during all of the Reagan administration. What what was the new right? How significant was it in the conservative movement, you know, 1979, 1980, 1981, obviously when President Reagan is elected? And give us a kind of an analogy to modern day conservatism to try to understand if there was a new right in 2021, right, who would it be? So take some, you know, leave the world of academia for a, sec a sec second, excuse me, and, you know, try to give us a picture of what the new right meant then. Yeah, so the new right emerged in the early 1970s. Um, and, you know, historians disagree about sort of the sort of the impetus or why they sort of came to fruition. I mean, my progressive colleagues like to cite sort of opposition to um, – integration uh, and other things like that sort of racial motivations i tend to point more so towards like desegregation the, like you know kind of civil rights movement stuff that's right and i tend to point more so to sort of um you know the sort of at the, the decision over roe v wade right the sort of emergence of um, abortion on the national stage in the mid-1970s initially led by catholics but then protestants were sort of brought along in opposition to roe um, the new right, by and large, um, was opposed was very socially conservative, and they were very, very, very innovative in their direct mail um, sort of campaign led by Richard Diggory, and they were very, very um, innovative in terms of the way in which they organized communities, um, and that was largely sort of um, you know Howard Phillips and, uh, um, and others um, within the new right. And um, what they did, they also linked themselves up by the late 1970s with people like Jerry Falwell, the moral majority, um, et cetera, to go into communities and mobilize people um, at the grassroots level so that they could upend uh, sort of established democratic politicians across the board. And they had great success in 1980. I think they were more proud probably uh, of sort of their victories in Congress and in the Senate than they were even of sort of Reagan's victory. I think they were all happy about Reagan although Reagan did have significant differences with them from time to time. What were some of the differences uh, between Reagan and Phillips and, and the new right? Uh, they were generally supportive of Reagan from 76 to 80, but um, they really were concerned about Reagan's selection of George H.W. Bush on, the, on his ticket. Uh, so talk about that. Yeah, I actually think that many members of the new right um, had supported Reagan in 1976, but by 1980, many of them were actually um, concerned about Ronald Reagan's age. They were also concerned because of Ronald Reagan's activity in California um, over the Briggs Amendment. So the Briggs Amendment was an amendment um, that was proposed by John Briggs that uh, was supported by Jerry Falwell and a large number of the new right which would have basically um, targeted homosexual teachers in California's public schools. Um, and Ronald Reagan came out against the Briggs Amendment. He thought it was a violation of individual liberty and had sort of um, the capacity to do great, great damage um, to individuals in California. And he actually stood against the new right, specifically against Briggs and Jerry Falwell, in opposing it. And so I think that— Not many people um, know or focus on that because they would just associate the social conservatives being one leg of the three-legged stool that uh, defined Reaganism. Uh, but that goes back to the way Reagan led in California and, and viewed things, you, you know, leading up to his presidency. Yeah, I mean, I oftentimes ask students after I teach them I, in sort of Amer my American Nation 2 class, I oftentimes lay out on the on the screen these platform planks or these policies that Reagan implemented in California, including gun control laws, um, legalizing abortion in certain circumstances, um, raising taxes, and he did reform welfare. Um, and I lay those out and I ask them, you know, first of all, what party does whoever support, whoever's policies these are, what party do they belong to? And they normally say, well, probably the Democratic Party. Um, and then I say, well, you know, who is this? Uh, and, you know, you get Jerry Brown. You know, if students don't know who's, uh, whose policies these were, what governor of California's policies these were, and you sort of 
click this, the next button on the on the slide, and it, you know Ronald Reagan and Nancy are standing there, uh, you know, sort of victorious uh, in the gubernatorial election, and students are really surprised um, by that. And we go through each one of those policies and why Reagan supported each one of those policies and how things changed by the time he came to office in 1980, uh, specifically on abortion. Um, he realized that, you know, uh, even having just sort of, you know, life of the mother sort of exceptions, in his view, it was expanded way beyond what he ever imagined that it would be expanded to. And so he he shifted his view by the by 1980 and by 1976, 1980 on that uh, to be very much pro-life. Um, but yeah, there is this evolution and this change, right, from uh, sort of Governor Reagan to President Reagan that I think sometimes is missed um, when we look back. And, and what I hear you saying there is, is sometimes it was Reagan's own revolution, uh, evolution, excuse me. Sometimes uh, he maintained that, and it was always a level of being remain, you know, remaining committed to principle, but not to the point where he wasn't able to to compromise. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're surprising your students, but also reminding people who have this is what your book does a defined view of what Reagan did, and perhaps overlook. Uh, other things that he, he did as well. One, one thing I note as we were talking about the new right and, and Howard Phillips, you mentioned the, the the Chamberlain, you know, appeasement, 1988, you know, uh, graphic that uh, you found in the archives when Phillips opposed the selection of George H. W. Bush. Uh, he also, at that time, you include in your book, uh, condemned Reagan. Again, using the same analogy, Governor Reagan sounds like Winston Churchill, but behaves like Neville Chamberlain. That was something you quote in the book, uh, Phillips responding to selection of George H.W. Bush. So an early, not just to the end of the presidency, but even the beginning of the presidency, this tension between uh, President Reagan and, and the new right. Is the new right truly reflective of movement conservatives back in 1980, or is it a marginal element? Give me the, your answer to that question. How, how would you kind of place them? Uh, is it is it, you know, Tea Party Republicans or a more marginal element from like the modern day Republican Party? I, th I would compare them to the Tea Party. I think they're the precursor to the Tea Party. And I mean, Howard Phillips basically says this, I think in 2000, 10 or so, he gets in front of a, or excuse me, Richard Vigory says this in 2010, he gets in front of a, uh, a crowd of Tea Party supporters, and he goes, where the hell have you people been? I've been waiting for you for 40 years, right? <laughs> uh, implying that, you know, the new right had finally found its people uh, with the Tea Party revolution. Um, but I do think that they were representative of a large swath of conservatives. Um, if you just look at, like, Phyllis Schlafly's um, another new right activist's sort of reach, right, with Eagle Forum. I mean, she's mobilizing women across the United States um, uh, in opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment, right? Um, something that also blows my students' minds, that uh, it was women who defeated the Equal Rights Am Amendment, um, homemakers um, and whatnot. But um, she, uh, she was mobilizing, and she had chapters all over the place. Same thing for um, a lot of these different organizations. The new right is... It's, I mean, in some ways, it's always hard to say, right? Does does Phyllis Shafley represent every, you know, every person who reads Eagle Forum? Well, I don't know, right? But she definitely had reach. She definitely had a lot of subscribers. Um, Richard Vigory is able to reach millions of people through direct mail, and there are so many new right organizations. Um, they sort of have an organization for everything, um, in defense of Taiwan. Like you, you just go through, like you just go through the archives. Um, and uh, it's really insane how many different small grassroots organizations sprouted up that were part of this sort of new right apparatus. So I think they were very representative of, of a large section of conservatives. Now, I think there are a large number of conservatives who didn't like the new right. If you think about Barry Goldwater, right? Um, Barry Goldwater right. famously say, said every good Christian should kick Jerry Falwell right in the ass, right? Because he's, you know, he's not representative of what, um, of what, Goldwater thought conservatism right. was. Um, and so there were a lot of fiscal conservatives, sort of Midwestern uh, conservatives, who wouldn't have identified, more libertarian conservatives, who would not have identified with the new right. Uh, but I do think that Howie Phillips uh, and company did represent a large segment of but the it, conservative movement. We'll get back to a little bit more in terms of how much Reagan courted the new right and movement conservatives, how much movement conservatives courted Reagan. And, and so much of that first half of the book is discussing that dynamic and, and the controversies and the tensions. 
but it wasn't just social conservatives. I mean, one of the things that your book outlines, it's, it's all kinds of conservatives. One thing that caught my attention early on is we're doing the Economic Recovery Tax Act, you know, hugely significant Reagan agenda, you know, the kind of Reaganomics coming into force. You note that it was the largest tax cut in American history, reducing marginal income taxes by 23%, providing tax relief for businesses and other industry. And, you know, huge accomplishment. It, it was it was passed overwhelmingly in both chambers. This wasn't, uh, you, know, bare, you know, where you needed the vice president to have the deciding vote in the Senate type thing. And then you note, supply siders such as Jack Kemp worried, and that, like you said, you know, the ink had barely dried on the act, right? The people like Kemp worried that Reagan was going too slowly and that his economic program was not bold enough. So the Art Laffers, the Jack Kemp's, those who we always would assume were the ones, you know, in the case of Jack Kemp doing the uh, touchdown dance, they also were not satisfied and felt that Reagan wasn't reflective or of everything they wanted to achieve and what the Reagan Re revolution should achieve. And we could throw David Stockman in that as well. We'll get to there in a second. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the pleasure of interviewing Art Laffer um, for the book. Um, we talked about this sort of at length. And I think that Dr. Laffer's major concern, and of course, I think Jack Kemp's major concern as well, was sort of the phase in of the tax cuts, right? Um, you weren't going to get the biggest bang for your buck because these things were going to be phased in over the course of three years. Um, I, I believe this was also borrowed from the Kennedy tax cuts in the 60s, this idea of sort of slowly phasing in the tax cuts in order to um, basically try to, basically the idea being you wouldn't have a shock right to revenue and other things like that, um, I assume. Um, but the problem for, for supply siders is that like if you cut taxes 5% this year, you, cut ten, you're, you tell everybody you're going to cut them 10% next year, people are going to sit on the sidelines waiting for the larger tax decrease before they go out and act. And so um, when I interviewed uh, Dr. Laffer, he insisted, he was very persistent, uh, as he is, uh, that uh, the phasing in actually prolonged recovery um, because people sat on the sidelines and that we might have had a more robust rec recovery if it hadn't been phased in. But you're absolutely right. By 1982, many of these supply siders are really angry with Reagan for agreeing with Tip O'Neill to raise taxes um, in 1982. And Lynn Knopfziger, who was a mainstay Reaganite, uh, was extraordinarily frustrated. Jack Kemp, uh, who some believe was angling for maybe to run for president himself in 1984, 1988. Um, they saw this as a betrayal of the Reagan revolution, even though Reagan saw it as simply closing loopholes um, and sort of, you know, uh, you know, sort of, it's kind of like a tax reform, right? These shouldn't have existed anyway. Simplifying the code, up. making it work more efficiently. Yeah, and he was promised, he was promised spending cuts uh, by Tip O'Neill, which he, I don't believe, ever got. Um, and so many supply siders were really irritated with Reagan in 1982 for raising, uh, for raising taxes. And, um, and, 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 you know, supply siders were people who were not particularly concerned about spending <laughs> and balancing the budget. And, you had another Reagan revolutionary, a uh, former colleague of Jack Kemp, who was the director of the Office of Management and Budget, David Stockman. And, and he was someone who really felt that the deficits were going to be too great for the economy to really uh, sustain. And so he pushed back on Kemp. And so President Reagan was, was balancing two revolutionaries who didn't see eye to eye and what the revolution should be doing, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, budget hawks, right? Fiscal conservatives, sort of old school, pre-supply side budget hawks, were not happy at all uh, with with the idea that you would um, you would increase military spending at the significantly increase military spending over military spending levels that had already been increased in the last two years of the Carter administration. Um, in in addition, right, to significantly cutting um, income tax rates. The old school sort of Republican budget hawks saw this as a, as a, as a disaster for the budget. Um, the and, Stockman and was a supply side or two. He just felt that they went too far, right? It's and interesting. Yeah, it is interesting about David Stockman. I think that David Stockman was a true believer in 1979, 1980, 1981. And I feel like um, after sort of the first round of budgetary talks where he could not get anybody 
nobody. He could get nobody in the administration. He would talk to cabinet heads and he tried to like get them to cut spending. And it was like pulling teeth for him. Um, he thought he could do both at the same time. He thought he could cut, you know, cut wasteful spending, decrease spending um, in the government. He wanted to in reform entitlement programs such as uh, Social Security and, and other programs. Which they got to eventually, but not at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And they never really reformed. They reformed them, but they never they never sort of privatized. You know, they didn't get the sort of mass reforms, I think, that someone like David Sondheim would have liked. Um, but he's trying to do all, you know, he's trying to get spending cuts at the same time that he's trying to, you know, cut the taxes. And so I think initially he thought he could pull it all together, right, and have a robust economic recovery with tax cuts and at the same time balanced budgets. And um, I mean, by I think 1982, Stockman's pretty disillusioned with the idea that you can do both uh, and and increase military spending at the same time. Um, and so I think by 1982 he becomes much more fiscally conservative and begins to sort of backtrack away from right. sort of the tax cut agenda. So we've talked about social conservatives. We've talked about. You know, the economic policy, supply siders, fiscal conservatives, tensions between the camps, those camps and President Reagan. What about the next leg of the stool, which is peace through strength, Cold War, defeating the Soviet Union? Surely, Marcus, that was one place where they all got in line, right? Well, not so much. Um, actually, um uh, Potteritz um, wrote, he's a neoconservative, uh, Norman Potteritz, a neoconservative um, intellectual, um, actually penned an op-ed in, in 1982, in which he looked back at the first two years of Reagan's um, foreign policy and basically you know, condemned Reagan for continuing what he believed was a policy of detente, okay? a cooling of tensions with the Soviet Union, not being harsh enough on the Soviets. Um, and this this op-ed has everything that you know you know a critic of. I mean, it, it is absolutely brutal. Let, let's just contextualize um, Norman yeah. Podhoretz for a second. He was a longtime editor of Commentary Magazine, which was must-read publication for neoconservatives, and he was a supporter in the '70s, as far as I understand, of Ronald Reagan. Reagan, of course, in 1976 was the leading voice in the conservative movement, certainly uh, in the race for the Republican nomination to critique detente and the approach employed by Henry Kissinger and most famously by President Nixon. And by 1982, Podhoris has given up on Reagan and he's doing this nationally in the form of a column. What was the great sin? What was the, I'm sorry, what did you say? What was the great sin, the Reagan sin here that, that he violated? Yeah, I think that he thought Reagan was being too weak on the Soviets. He thought he actually, I think, even states here. If he doesn't state it here, it's stated in the Conservative Digest piece a little bit later in nineteen, I think, 19, late nineteen eighty two, maybe nineteen eighty three. Um, he basically says that you know Reagan is being weaker than Carter on uh, on the Soviets. Carter had at least uh, imposed an embargo, a grain embargo, um, had pulled the United States out of the Olympics. Um, but really, it's kind of the same criticism that Howie Phillips has of Reagan, that he's all talk and no sort of action. That he talks a great game. You'd think that Ronald Reagan was a bellicose, bellicose um, sort of cold warrior by the way he talks. I mean, his first press conference in the Soviet Union, right? He condemns them. Um, the Soviets are like, whoa, this guy may actually be for real uh, in terms of his distrust of us. Um, so he does, he walks the walk with the rhetoric, but but Potteris says he's just not doing what he needs to do in terms of sort of the policy. Um, he condemns him for not sort of sending um, aid to Poland. There's an incident in Poland. We now know that that we were there. Uh, the CIA was there. We, sure. were, we were behind the scenes. Uh, but he didn't know that at the time. Potteris didn't. Um, and so he's condemning him for, for, for those activities. He condemns him uh, sort of in Latin America. It's really across the board. Um, and I want to link that criticism with what takes place in uh, Conservative Digest, because you don't just have neoconservatives who are upset with the president's foreign policy. You also have social conservatives who are very hawkish, very anti-Soviet Union because of their religious beliefs, um, um, very much at odds with the Soviets, upset with him. Um, and you also have just sort of mainstream conservatives, um, sort of the sort of conservative anti-detente folks um, angry at him as well. Um, in Conservative Digest, um, there's a series of generals who were sympathetic to Reagan, who had supported Reagan, uh, 
One of them gives Reagan a two out of 10 in his foreign policy for the first two years. Um, Midge Dechter, I believe, writes in there that, you know, he's ba it's basically just Carterism uh, without Carter. Um, and so they're overwhelmingly critical. And that criticism continues up until really 1983, um, when Ronald Reagan, um, you know, famously calls the, the Soviet Union the evil empire. He also unveils SDI. So, so more, record, more rhetoric, it kind of does the trick. That's right. He has more rhetoric, but he also has SDI, which um, is obviously— So this is the Star um, Wars program, the Chief Defense Initiative. That's right. And so he implements that. Many of them are very satisfied with, with sort of Reagan's— uh, sort of shift, a little bit more aggressive shift in 1983. He also deploys Pershing uh, missiles, right, uh, to Western Europe to counter the SS-20s that the Soviets deployed during the Carter years. That was something that Carter had promised to do, that Reagan had also promised to continue. So he, do, he does all those things, right, which satisfy conservatives. Um, but by the end of 1983, all of those actions had sort of agitated the KGB to such an extent that, like, Reagan begins getting reports from um, the British um, about what the KGB is up to, and the, 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 he spooks the Soviets so bad that in early late 1983, early 1984, he actually backs away uh, from much of that rhetoric and decides to really press again. He'd already been pressing for engagement with Soviet leaders, but he well, really didn't have a, he didn't have a Soviet leader to engage with. He had a little problem there with he kept dying on him. Others. others they died on him, right? And yeah, Brezhnev he kept dying on him. But he really does extend again, um, he does extend again sort of the offer uh, of really to sit down and talk um, with the Soviet leadership about potential arms reductions, which will get him in trouble with conservatives later on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll jump to that in a minute. But you've described how those outside the White House, those in Congress, well, some in the administration, movement conservatives outside are – unconvinced and they're taking whatever Reagan gives, but they want more. Yeah. What do we know about president Reagan's view of all these people who were his supporters, who much, much of what he believes aligns with what they believe uh, still never seems to be able to satisfy them or, you know, significant moments in his presidency, they're critiquing him. Yeah, I mean, we can we we know quite a bit um, from the Reagan diaries. He he writes from time to time, right? He he's <laughs> when Jack Kemp's very vocal in criticizing him, he writes in his diary how frustrated he is uh, with Jack Kemp, sort of grandstanding, if you will. Um, I don't know the exact language; I don't have it in front of me, but you know, sort of going out into the media and criticizing him on his sort of right flank. He also, I mean, when when Podrets wrote his piece, he actually calls him. Hey, he picks up the phone and calls him, and they have President Reagan calls Norman Podhoretz. That's right. He calls him, and he says, you know, they have a, a long conversation in which Reagan tries to convince him, tries to convince him that he's not, um, that he's not following a policy of detente, and uh, he's the president's unsuccessful ultimately in convincing him of that. Um, when William F. Buckley will later run negative pieces in National Review about him, Buckley at least extends him the courtesy of sending him a, a letter or calling him himself um, and telling him. And uh, Reagan, by the end of his administration, just has to come to terms with the fact that these people have um, – their goals are slightly different from the administration's, right? Their goal, as uh, Richard Vigory told me in an interview, was to push – Tell us Reagan who Richard Vigory is. Yeah, Richard Vigory was the, the the direct mail um, guy from the uh, the New Right, uh, prominent member of the New Right. When I interviewed him, he said, "Listen, my job was to push Reagan right to go as far to the right as I possibly could. Um, his job was to govern. <laughs> my job was to pull him as far to the right uh, in governing as possible." So I think that Reagan realized that many of these people had um, sort of. You know, they they had constituents, they had you know subscribers, and they had a they had an obligation to those people to try and pull Reagan as far to the right as they possibly could. Did they uh, feel that, that Reagan wasn't giving them an opportunity to hear their voice? I mean, there's famed stories you read, you know, um, Martin Anderson's Revolution, some of these other books that he'd have regular meetings. They'd come in, you know, that that there was this recognition in the White House to have the members of the Revolution come in and and the coalition kind of make sure they had a voice. Yeah, no, I think they definitely were listened to. Uh, I think Reagan definitely did more than any other president had ever done to bring conservatives into the White House and to listen to them and let them sort of vent their spleen, right, and complain and 
and critique him even at times. Um, he recounts some of these meetings being just sort of kind of shocked at some of the response he gets, especially when he tries to convince them that Gorbachev is a trustworthy Soviet leader. He kind of just gets crickets uh, after he uh, makes a speech to them. And I mean, Reagan, um, thankfully for me, Reagan employed Morton Blackwell, who's now um, the head of the Leadership Institute um, in DC, uh, which trains young conservatives, he employed him to be his liaison within the administration to conservative groups. And so luckily for me, this is where a lot of the material for the book comes from. It comes from Morton Blackwell writing conservatives after they've written him, right? Um, right. People from all over the conservative movement write, write in and say, hey, I'm upset about this, or I really praise the president for doing X or Y. And, and it's, it was Mr. Blackwell's job to try and keep all these people happy. So I do think that's absolutely correct, Roger, that I think that he did more than anybody else to bring conservatives in, to make them a part, uh, to feel a part of the administration, um, to make them feel as if he was listening to them. But when it came down to policy, um, Reagan had to be prudent in terms of what type well, he, of policy. He made he deals and he, and he governed and he pushed things forward. I'm sure having you know Jim Baker as the chief of staff and you're right. I mean, they drove drove them crazy, but you know, deals were made, packages got through, and and Reagan consistently got eighty percent. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, I think you know, one of the things that constantly when I present this, especially when I talk with conservative scholars, they're like, they're like, are you questioning whether or not the Reagan Revolution actually took place? And my answer to that is no. I absolutely believe that the country moved significantly to the right in the 1980s. And one of Reagan's greatest accomplishments is that he moved the political discourse um, to the right so that someone like Bill Clinton actually ends up, if you look at Clinton's economic policies, um, passing, you know, balance, he has balanced budgets, he passes welfare reform, right? Um, we have banking deregulation in the 1990s. I mean, Clinton in many ways um, is trapped by sort of the limitations that have been imposed on him because the Reagan revolution was so successful. My book doesn't question whether or not the Reagan revolution was successful in an absolute sense or an objective sense. It questions whether or not conservatives actually saw it as being successful. And in 1988, 1989, many of them, when Reagan left office, didn't think that it was successful. Matter of fact, 1986, 1987, many of them are, they're just biding their time, hoping that they'll get a true conservative in the White House in 1988. And a lot of that is kind of result of the INF treaty and the way Reagan chose to double down on his relationship with Gorbachev, seizing the opportunity not to just do arms control negotiation, but to do arms control reduction came quite close to having an agreement to do away with all nuclear weapons. But of course, INF, it was uh, the shorter range. Talking about Jesse Helms, here you have stalwart North Carolina Senator chairman or senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, critical person to get a treaty through the Senate. You have a very popular president of the United States who's accomplished a lot by the time the INF Treaty comes around, put the pressure on the Soviets. What's his reaction to INF and his willingness to work with President Reagan? Yeah, I, I mean, Jesse Helms and other, uh, other conservatives in the Senate um, – Oppose, right? They oppose the INF treaty. Uh, they don't um, want to see the INF treaty pass. Many of them think that it's non-verifiable. It's just not verifiable. You can't verify whether or not the Soviets actually destroy their weapons. Um, and they think that, and they probably think along the same lines as Margaret Thatcher would have thought that nuclear weapons are actually our best safeguard uh, against the Soviet Union. That having the Pershings in uh, West, Ger you know, in West Germany is actually probably makes us safer. And by removing, right? Um, sort of, you know, intermediate range uh, nuclear weapons, we're actually going to give the Soviets an advantage because, A, we can't verify that they got rid of their own weapons. Can we really trust them? I mean, after all, these are the folks who had the gulag, right? Uh, can we really trust these people, um, first of all? But then the other thing is that they're not wrong, <laughs> that um, the Soviets have a much larger conventional, um, you know, sort of uh, military, right? Um, so, um, I think that they have legitimate fears. And I think to a certain extent, Jesse Helms and other conservatives' criticism of Reagan over the INF Treaty, um, while I do think their criticism was genuine, I think that it was geared towards the, go the goal was not, they knew they weren't going to defeat the INF Treaty. Their goal was to stop Reagan from pursuing any other crackpot plans to, to, you know, to completely eliminate nuclear weapons. Because 
Ronald Reagan was a nuclear abolitionist. Uh, he would have liked to have seen no nuclear weapons um, in the United States or in the Soviet Union. This is one of the reasons he believes so much in SDI. He's like, well, we'll just create this anti-ballistic missile system, right? And, um, and and we'll just share the technology with the Soviets, and then it will render the nuclear weapons obsolete. Which Mikhail Gorbachev can... himself didn't believe would happen. <laughs> yeah, Gorbachev, there's no way. We can't even get you to share, like, brain technology with us or something. You know, we can't get you to share, like, rudimentary computer technology with us. How are we going to get you to uh, share SDI? There's no way uh, Gorbachev, you know, realized that there's no way that, you know, the sort of you know general the generals the military in, in, pre in president reagan's mind that was entirely consistent with peace through strength uh and yet other conservatives didn't quite trust him to be able to deliver the types of things he thought the inf treaty uh and negotiations with gorbachev would deliver yeah, I mean, I one conservative said, listen, if, if, if it was Jimmy Carter who was espousing these things, we'd be up in arms, man. We'd be protesting. We'd be rioting. We'd be rioting our senators. Like, But just because it's Reagan, everybody's sitting around letting it happen. Um, they were appalled. I mean, they would have called Carter naive, right? So, so um, let, Carter, let's transition then to um, – let, let's transition then to post-Reagan presidency because the most significant the hap thing that happens – when President Reagan leaves office, is the Soviet Union falling apart? The Cold War war comes to an end, and much of what Reagan did, and what much of what President Reagan believed about Gorbachev, actually played out. How did those movement conservatives, those skeptics of President Reagan, and this gets to the legacy piece? kind of incorporate those developments and develop the narrative as to how they delivered a Cold War victory. Yeah, so that's one of the really, I think, interesting findings from the book is that many of these conservatives um, actually oppose the policies that I claim, and I think most historians claim, led to the end of the Cold War, which is mainly uh, sort of the INF Treaty, the sort of easing of tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. Many historians actually date the end of the Cold War um, to like 1989, 1990, before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, right? That Reagan had put us on a path, and George H.W. Bush continued on that path, um, toward sort of reconciliation and de-escalating de tensions with the Soviets. Um, and those are the very policies, right, that conservatives um, had opposed during the late 1980s. Um, and so conservatives, what they do initially is they immediately take credit, right, for the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and they say, yes, uh, we we and our policies, peace through strength via President Reagan, right, um, drove the Soviets, either spent the Soviets into bankruptcies and often used sort of phrase, although um, that becomes, that accelerates much, much later and becomes sort of part of the narrative around sort of uh, the idea that Reagan won the Cold War by sticking to his conservative principles. Um, but they begin to adopt, right, this idea that the Republican Party and the conservative movement are credit for the victory of the United States over the Soviet Union. Um, and one of the things I think is so interesting in those early years, 1989 to 1992, 1993, is that Reagan addresses these issues specifically in his autobiography, um, but he also addresses them um, on the campaign trail. Um, he addresses them in speeches um, when he dedicates um, – the sort of the Reagan Library itself, and um, uh, when they get a piece of the Berlin Wall. Um, and Reagan consistently says that the people who won the Cold War were the people who refused to remain enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, that it's the people right across um, Eastern Europe who rose up against the Soviet Union and demanded individual liberty and rights. Now, he's probably downplaying to a certain extent his role in encouraging them, right, encouraging solidarity in Poland, for instance, and elsewhere. He also gives credit to uh, Helm Cole, he gives credit to Margaret Thatcher, he gives credit to Gorbachev um, for Gorbachev's kinder, kinder gentler uh, sort of socialism. Um, and of course, Gorbachev ultimately, if he had rolled tanks, you know, if he had rolled tanks into Eastern Europe and imposed sort of Soviet domination, the Soviet Union might still be around today. Um, but he would refuse to do that. And as a result, the Soviet Union began to fracture, and eventually nationalist movements emerged all over the Soviet Union, including in Russia, right? 
uh, under Yeltsin that ultimately led to the the end of the Soviet Union. So let me, let me just um, push back a little bit on that. I mean, I, it makes sense to me and to others who are admirers of President Reagan and a student of President Reagan, both his time in office and outside of office, that he would give credit to others. And, you know, success has a you know, thousand fathers here. And in this case, there are lots of things that happen, be it, you know, the oppressed people that sought liberty, Gorbachev himself, allies, Cole, Thatcher. But at the end of the day, Reagan's peace through strength approach Defense buildup, SDI, deploying missiles in Europe, his rhetoric of evil empire, all of which spooked, right? And made it clear in the mindset of Gorbachev and others that this is a serious challenge and we, we might, might not be able to keep up and, and made them second guess whether they could prevail in the conflict. So it's a question of how much you emphasize it. But that quote unquote narrative or, or what you and your, you know, in the book talk about mythology, um, Reagan myth, I mean, it's grounded in facts. It's just a question of how much weight we give each and every one of these variables. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a variety of factors. I think that um, the claims that are made generally by people who are part of what I call the Reagan victory school, there's this claim that the United States sort of um, spent the Soviet Union into bankruptcy. But if we look at Soviet um, sort of spending and military uh, on the military declined throughout the 1980s as part of Gorbachev's plan was to cut spending on the military so he could shift in his command economy uh, to spending on consumer durables because, I mean, the Russians were literally alcoholics uh, when uh, when um, Gorbachev took office. Um, he, he's got a major alcoholism problem. He's got an absentee problem. He's got a war in Afghanistan, right, that is bleeding the country white, which Reagan, of course, did. Uh, funnel weapons and training uh, through Pakistan to the Mujahideen. Um, he used the uh, CIA combat. and, and Director Casey. I mean, that was part of that's the strategy. That's definitely true. Um, so that's that's definitely true. Um, but we don't see an actual an increase in spending um, in terms of like on the military during those years. Um, gas prices, right? Um, that hurt the Soviets. They had sort of enjoyed a, an oil boom, right? As gas prices had been increasing during the 1970s. Uh, Brezhnev enjoyed lots and lots and lots of uh, revenues so that he could build up the Soviet military. Um, gas prices are on the decline in the 1980s, which is obviously hurting the Soviet Union. Um, and in some ways, Reagan deserves credit for that. Um, there was, of course, I think there were some secret sort of operations in order to try and uh, drive those prices back down to sort of market levels. But Reagan also deserves a lot of credit in the United States for lifting so, sort of... Uh, yeah, the economic uh, strength package was a key component, not just for the good of, of the country here, but also in the context of the Cold War strategy. Yeah, I actually, but I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if you're asking me, I think Reagan's important. I think I say that throughout the book. Like, I think yes. Reagan plays an important role in the end of the Cold War. I'm not like some of my colleagues, maybe the majority of my colleagues, who think that regardless of who was in the White House, uh, the Soviet Union would have collapsed in 1991. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't buy that um, at all. Um, but having said that, I think that the Reagan Victory School goes too far. I actually think Ronald Reagan deserves a great amount of credit um, for the things that I've talked about um, earlier, which is engaging with Mikhail Gorbachev, enabling Gorbachev, giving him some leeway and some room with the hardliners. Every time Reagan said something like evil empire, all he did was embolden the hardliners in the Soviet Union who pushed back against Gorbachev and his engagement. And so in some ways, Reagan's rhetoric at times hurt Secretary Schultz and others' attempts to give Gorbachev the leeway, if you will, to implement Glasnost and Perestroika, um, which ultimately, I think, exposed what was already a decaying Soviet right. Union. And I mean, Reagan deserves a lot of credit because he, he comes across prescient because he believes in market capitalism and entrepreneurship and the vitality of America's economic system. And he recognizes, whereas many of his contemporaries don't, that the Soviet Union and their commun communist slash socialist economic system, right, um, is not going to be able to keep up with the United States. In that, he's echoing sort of George Kennan's uh, early, early analysis of the Soviet Union. If we just bottle them up, man, uh, capitalism, Western capitalism right. will win and so socialism will fail. The advocate of the system, evangelizing the system, and ultimately that was a key ingredient. We have a, a few minutes left, and I want to deal with the end of your book, which, of course, concludes in 2016 right 
uh, taking us through not just Reagan's engagement with movement conservatives during his presidency, but how he was remembered afterwards. We just dealt with a, one example of that. Um, but then President Trump's elected in 2016, assumes office in 2017, and you have people noting, uh, and you do so at the end of your book, that Trump didn't run on Reagan. That's actually uh, a quote from the public intellectual columnist uh, Charlie Krodheimer. Rich Lowry, National Review, uh, wrote a piece that got a lot of attention saying this is the end of Reaganism and actually felt that we needed conservatives not to run on Reagan. They needed new language. How do you integrate all of that 2016 and after uh, with your thesis and view of Reagan and the right. Yeah. So the second half of the book, as you, as you mentioned, focuses on how conservatives sort of reimagine Reagan and their relationship to Reagan from the 1990s all the way up until uh, Donald Trump's election. I believe I end with uh, Trump's, uh, with Trump's election in 2016. Um, and so one of the things that I argued is that the thing that held the conservative movement together in the wake of the Cold War was um, this idea, this common language, right, uh, this common history that they had that was ingrained within the Reagan administration itself. Um, and Trump just Trump bucks that. And in many ways, by 2016, really, you could argue by 2008, all of that had become a little stale. Um, it didn't necessarily speak to the problems, right, that the American people had in 2012 or 2016. And Donald Trump is a is a blunt instrument, uh, but he definitely definitely spoke to the pain and the suffering that many many Americans felt um, in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, right? And I think that that's um, sort of one of the reasons for his success is because he deviated from the playbook that Reagan had offered. Um, but Trump but had, you even note that the playbook that Trump employed, perhaps not the tactics or the tone. But having an ear to that demographic of the country and those people in need is a very Reagan-esque thing to do. In the sense that uh, Reagan did it in 1980 by bringing in those sort of uh, Democrats, those work blue-collar Democrats, if you will, into his coalition. That's an example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think in some ways, um, you know, Trump is a deviation from Reaganism in the way that Reagan was a deviation from sort of the country club moderate Republican Party of 1980. I think that that's very true. Um, Reagan, of course, offered um, a much more hopeful vision. He offered a vision of free trade and uh, sort of free markets, um, smaller government, um, reforming and uh, sort of entitlements and decreasing regulations. And Trump borrowed some of that, um, but definitely in terms of sort of his stance on immigration and trade, offered something very, very different. And like you said, like you alluded to, his tone, um, Reagan's the great optimist. Uh, Donald Trump's tone, much, much darker. We got to jump to the lightning round in just a minute, but I'd like to get your reaction to a speech that Nikki Haley, the former ambassador to the United Nations during the Trump administration and before that, governor in South Carolina. Uh, some expect her to run for the Republican nomination in 2024. She gave a speech at the Reagan Library as part of our Time for Choosing series, and we're having every month or so leading voices in the conservative movement talk about why they're Republican, how is the party succeeding, failing, what can everybody unite around, and how do Republicans win again? I want to read you some of what she said and get your reaction to whether or not you think this is learning the right lessons from your book, Marcus, and from the Trump years. She said, it's become fashionable in some circles, even conservative ones, to dismiss the relevance of Reagan. They say we must move beyond Reaganism. Times change. They say it's only right to change with them. Now, she notes that every era has these unique challenges. But she writes or says, no period in history provides an exact map for today. But dismissing the lessons of Reagan makes no more sense than dismissing the lessons of Lincoln or Washington. We must not reject the profound wisdom of our past. It's a sure way to destroy our future. This is someone who the party may get behind. There's certainly a lot of enthusiasm. Is she understanding the message and lessons of your book? 
Well, um, I doubt that I doubt, doubt that Nikki Haley has read the book. But uh, as far as the lessons go, um, I think that um, I think that she's not wrong. That Ronald Reagan does offer us. Um, he offers us a lot of wisdom. He offers us a lot of policies that were were extremely successful. And to the extent that you believe that economics is a science and that the laws of supply and demand do not change, uh, many of Reagan's policies, right, uh, will work. They'll bring about economic growth and prosperity today, just as they did in the 1980s. Um, but I think it matters what lessons Nikki Haley's talking about. Is she talking about Ronald Reagan's sort of welcoming of uh, immigrants into the country, the granting of amnesty to almost 3 million Americans? Um, is she talking about um, Ronald Reagan's willingness to compromise um, with Democrats to build coalitions that are beyond just the Republican Party? Um, is she talking about Ronald Reagan's ability to reform entitlements in a pragmatic manner, um, even when he would have preferred, I think, to have gotten rid of Social Security, um, you know, in order to sort of sustain um, those programs and sort of put him on sort of a path to stability? I don't know what lessons she's specifically talking about. But I think if the Republican Party has to choose, and I'm going to take off my historian hat and just be myself for a minute, if the Republican Party has to choose between uh, sort of the lessons of Reagan and Reaganism um, and sort of the um, nativism of, of a Trump, um, I think that it should very much go back to sort of the positive, optimistic, inclusive tone of Reagan uh, rather than to continue down sort of uh, what I think is a very, very dark, uh, sort of very sort of hyper-nationalist uh, path of Trump. Um, once again, those are just my views, um, not necessarily as a historian. Well, views of getting the author of Getting Right with Reagan, The Struggle for True Conservatism, nine, uh, 1980 to 2016. It's a, a, a great read, uh, well-researched and sourced, uh, but quite interesting. Gives a richer uh, understanding of how a Republican president uh, engage with the conservative movement uh, before and after. Uh, let's conclude with our lightning round, one that you're eminently qualified uh, to participate in. This is where you give us, share with our listeners and viewers, your favorite book on President Reagan, favorite speech by President Reagan, and, and favorite Reagan quote. Give us all three, two, or just one. Okay, so my favorite book on President Reagan is by James Wilson. It's called The Triumph of Improvisation. It's about the end of the Cold War. I recommend that to everybody. My favorite speech um, that Reagan gave is his last speech on January 19, 1989. Um, he gave a speech on uh, the values and the virtues of immigrants uh, to the United States. Uh, some of the most positive um, sort of language about the importance of immigration to the United States in that, in that speech. And then my favorite quote from Reagan comes from his farewell address. And if you don't mind, Roger, I'll just go ahead and- uh, Let's do it. it. Yeah. He said, quote, I've spoken of the shining city of the hill, of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how, that's how I saw it then. And that's how I see it still. I Marcus think that Witcher, quote, thank you very much. A uh, great way to end the show. If you come to Washington DC and join us, here in the Mike Kerr Media Room at the Reagan Institute, you'll pass one of uh, our walls here that has that exact quote up for the public to, to enjoy and, and to read. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for having me.